I had an introduction here. Yeah, I, the first thing I should say um, is this is the introduction. Uh, but if I were a farmer, I would have a cruder expression uh, for the things I'm about to say. Um, uh, first of all, I am not a physicist, and uh, my life uh, physically was divided before COVID. Uh, I had two wonderful physics collaborators, Dirk Kreimer and Pierre Van Hove, uh, but uh, with the advent of the, the COVID, uh, Dirk retired and Pierre uh, subsequently moved to Geneva. So I was kind of uh, left without my my physics collaborators. Um, but let me say a few words about math and physics because I think uh, there's, there's the potential there for misunderstanding. And um, I, I think uh, a little skepticism is, is in order. Um, math, uh, maybe better algebraic geometry, um, in the hands of Grothendieck, uh, of course, who everybody is uh, aware of, uh, introduced the, the notion of motive. And so uh, when physics uh, looked, looked at the situation, uh, they looked for applications of motives uh, to physics. Uh, but um, in my opinion, I, a certain skepticism is in order when you try to define Feynman uh, motives. Uh, certainly there are relations in physics certainly uses algebraic geometry uh, a, a lot, but it's not clear whether the notion of motive is the right pathway uh, to join the two subjects. Um, one reason I'm skeptical is because uh, so important to the notion of motive is the notion of uh, Frobenius and the eigenvalues of Frobenius, which depend upon a choice of a finite prime P. Uh, and such a choice is rather, uh, well, let's just say that physicists don't ordinarily, uh, when they wake up in the morning, decide to work with uh, P equals seven uh, today. Uh, there's really no reason P equals 11 would seem to be equally good, whereas a, a an arithmetician makes a big makes a big distinction. Um, so I, I think I, I don't want to say it's wrong, but it it it's it doesn't fit quite naturally. Um, but there is, and, and so I, people, including myself, were skeptical about about any serious deep uh, relation with, between physics and algebraic geometry. But um, I want to say that this lecture is a little bit more optimistic than that, because uh, there are other things involved in the notion, in the algebra geometric notion of motive, uh, which do um, show up uh, in physics. Um, and the one that I really want to promote, although I won't say that much about it today, I don't understand it that well, but there is a, it would seem that there is an interesting relation in physics uh, with the notion of height and heights, I mean, heights in the arithmetic sense. Uh, if uh, I will explain in, in detail later, but just vaguely, uh, heights are um, uh, appearing on, uh, on, on zero cycles on a curve with disjoint support. Uh, you get something called the Archimedean uh, height. And this does show up in physics or plays a role in physics. And uh, so that's kind of the theme that I want to uh, suggest. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add a little bit to that uh, already then. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, first of all, I think with with your paper with Pierre and also Matt Kerr, uh, you you already sh uh, sh basically showed that certain uh, Feynman integrals are related to al uh, algebraic geometry and to the 
um, variation of hot structure of these um, of these um, <clears throat> um, algebraic geometric object that you associated to them, and that has. Uh, become uh, very useful. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, that's directly useful for calculating Feynman graphs. And um, and then whether the these uh, these Frobenius actions and let's say um, things like maybe the global ha uh, global Hasselwald setter function and its L functions will also determine. I mean, they determine also values of Feynman integrals. And that's also interesting. I don't know whether this is so interesting because, of course, we want to have the Feynman graph for all physical parameters and not just for special physical parameters. Um, but I think um, uh, the well, the application of um, of these uh, these uh, these papers that you, Pierre, and and um, and Chuck Dor and other people wrote. Um, um, facilitate the calculation of Feynman graphs. I mean, this can nobody can deny this. I mean, of course, it's all uh, relatively uh, uh, at the level of differential equations and stuff like that, or quite ordinary stuff. And um, well, certainly differential equations. I, I, I mean, no, I don't mean to cast dispersion on differential equations, which are obviously right. central um, as a tool for calculation, if nothing else. But but. Uh, um, I mean, in fact, I would say for something else as well. But but in any case, uh, what I want to, maybe I shouldn't ex express it so negatively, what I want to focus on, or one thing I want to point out, that I, I really don't know what I'm talking about here. I'm not a physicist. And as I, uh, as I well, I'm not a physicist. Um, but uh, there, the, the, the role of height is what I want to emphasize in, in this talk because it is something that is central in arithmetic algebraic geometry. And it would seem that it also plays an interesting role uh, in physics. So that's- uh, I mean, that's what we want to, uh, we'll, uh, we'll sort of uh, focus our attention at the end. Uh, you will <laughs> tell us what well, you think. I don't know what I will tell you. We'll, we'll see what-, what We will uh, see. Happens. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about is, uh, a paper joint with uh, Amini and uh, Burgos Gill and Frezan, uh, which was written uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, it's published in uh, Isvestia Math uh, volume 80, uh, but they don't have a date on it. So I'm not sure the year, but it's volume 80 and it's pages five through 40. Um, now let's see if there was something else I wanted to wanted to say by way of uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so let's just move on. Uh, so how do I? Uh, I want to. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to explain the the setup. Uh, it's uh, sort of geometric in in nature. Uh, M sub G and N will be the moduli space or the moduli stack, or it, it all gets quite technical, but we can be vague, uh, of genus G curves with N marked points. And to each point we associate, uh, and this is, this is kind of complicated, it's, it's good to keep in mind what's going on here. We associate a vector in uh, space-time uh, Rd, our dimension capital D. And we uh, immediately do something extremely confusing. And we call the vectors that we have chosen Pi as well. So P, Pi might mean a point on, on, on a particular genus G curve, or it might mean a, a vector uh, in, in, uh, in that uh, space. Um, uh, I, 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 I've I never got completely clear uh, what, the, what the right usage is, uh, but we can be vague. Um, we also are given a bilinear form uh, on the space-time on RD uh, with reasonable bilinear form properties. I, I'm gonna systematically be a little bit vague. I'm not 
trying to impart uh, the knowledge so you can build a bomb. Uh, it's simply to understand vaguely the situation and then you can research for yourself the details. So I'm going to be a little vague from time to time. Um, and these, uh, the PIs that, that we, we have, the P1 up to Pn, will satisfy a conservation law, namely that the sum uh, will be zero. <clears throat> and uh, I will have a volume form on the, uh, yeah, on the moduli space. Uh, the volume form, this is tricky because we have these PIs but I will make the volume form independent of the of the PIs. It doesn't it doesn't see the, uh, the the vectors, and we'll also introduce a number alpha prime which is greater than zero, and um, I think that alpha prime is supposed to mean something about the string length, but little though I know about physics, I know even less about uh, about uh, uh, string theory, uh, so. The string length uh, is, uh, I don't know what it is, but in any case, if you take it and square it, you get alpha prime. Okay, so, all right, so now this is a kind of uh, a very basic point. Um, what I'm after, just so you you can follow the, 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 the thread, uh, what I'm after is um, the, the link, at a certain moment, like you're in, in listening to music in, in the orchestra, uh, and at a certain moment, the, there will appear the the soprano who's singing high C, and the soprano uh, is the uh, uh, is the height. So when you when I start referring to height, you should you should uh, pay attention. But until then, you can just ignore that. Is what I say. Um, the um, uh, what am I saying here? Uh, yeah, so alpha prime is the string length. Now, capital F will occur. Uh, it's a, it plays an important role, but it's a, it's a little uh, hard to uh, uh, to describe it. Um, it's a what, what shall I say? Um, well, it's an expression here. Um, where the if I hadn't put the prime on the g sub c, I would be talking about the Green's function. So I would be taking the product of two copies of c cross c, and the Green's function uh, would be a function on that product. And as a first approximation, you can think of something like log of x minus or log of the absolute value of x minus y kind of thing. That's a typical Green's function. Um, but Green's functions like log of x minus y have the unfortunate uh, tendency to blow up uh, on the diagonal. So when x equals y, you have log of zero, and who knows what that is. Um, so, uh, of course, then some clever person had the idea, of, well, we don't want that, so we'll have some nice way of modifying the Green's function to take finite values on the diagonal. And such a thing is called a regularized Green's function. And um, that's what we, we want. And so I denote it by a, a, a prime here. I won't be any more specific. In fact, uh, the, the reference that I'm uh, using for this is itself not, not very specific about what they mean by a regularized Green's function. But uh, the string amplitude now is, and I don't know anything about string theory, uh, but uh, it, it's the gadget that, that plays a role. So let me at least vaguely say what these things are. Um, so the basic uh, notion is this A alpha prime of G and P. And what that is, is the integral over this moduli stack of genus G curves, MG with N labeled N marked points. Uh, so over uh, this, this space of the exponential of minus I times the, the alpha prime here, the string length squared uh, times D of D sub V, DV of sub G and, and N, sort of a volume 
uh, on the uh, on the modular uh, space. Um, yeah. So is there anything more I want to say? Uh, that's the classical notion of the string amplitude. And if if a physicist wants to object, I would be I would be happy to to hear a more expert opinion. But that's what I think the string amplitude is. Anyway. Or, but I'm a little bit confused uh, uh, of, okay, of the variables. Uh, so uh, so first you say f depends on this sigma. So sigmas are uh what are points on the curve. so sigmas are the, the the yeah i've changed notation this is unfortunate sigmas are the uh the the, the more mark points yeah that's i mean not the point. various notions will be used for the mark points right. so the the here at the top of the slide they're written pi uh, here they get written sigma i i'm i'm undoubtedly copying from something at this point and i have no idea uh, what. right and then but then the f uh, also depends on the p of course or uh... no no uh, well yes i mean because uh, uh, by definition right. so i should i should put the p's also as well as the sigma but you yeah. didn't it doesn't matter didn't. and then and then um in the next expression, you integrate over the moduli space, and then. Oh, yeah, well, okay. I integrate the, the dvg. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And 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 so this is the uh, what what I understand uh, to be the string amplitude. But I welcome any correction from physicists or. Yeah, that's the. Use of the variables was a little bit confusing, but I think it. Yes, I'm saying, yeah, mm. right. Uh, I make a note here. Uh, don't confuse the genus G with the regularized Green's function. Yeah, G. Okay, sure. They have nothing to do with each other right. other than. Mm. Yeah. And C simply means the curve, right? The string version. C is, the, C is the, certainly the curve, yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So now let's see what happens here. If I do that, now, I, I want to go to the next. I want to go to the next. Oh, there. Okay. Um, right. So, so that was the string amplitude. But now we, I want to talk about the Feynman amplitude, which is more a little more familiar, maybe. Uh, and it works like this: G is a graph with edges e, and y sub little e uh, denote the vari a set of variables, uh, one for each edge. Uh, they are called edge variables. And uh, psi sub g is the first semantic polynomial of g. So there are two semantic polynomials. There is the first one and the second one. Uh, so psi, I think that's a psi, and, and this is a phi, uh, psi sub g is the first one, and phi sub g is the second one. Now, the second one is a little more confusing because uh, in addition to the edge variables, it depends also on momentum. And right. that's it seems like kind of a technical point, but it, it's really crucial uh, to keep that in mind because uh, it's it, various expressions uh, inherit a dependence on momentum because they involve the second semantic polynomial. Uh, now, using the first semantic, using just the first semantic polynomial, we get a measure uh, which is d pi, uh, which is a negative power. Uh, remember, capital D was the, the well, if you look back and you find capital D, uh, and, and so, psi appears in the denominator to a power d over two, and then the edge variables uh, appear. As, uh, so that's the, the, the volume form. Actually, um, um, Spencer, I still have a question. I mean, uh, is, is the um, second semantic polynomial not depending secretly on something which is Lorentz invariant? Because the individual p would, if you make a Lorentz transformation in space-time, they would change. Well, certainly the second semantic depends on p. Uh, but, but maybe on combination of p's like uh, scalar products or something. That's, well, that uh, yeah, that would depend yeah, on okay. if you chose a stupid situation, it, 
it would mess that up. But but uh, undoubtedly, in in physically meaningful situations, that's the case. But okay. I don't I, I don't think there's any specific. Uh, I mean, I can I, I can you know I've got the the the, the computer. I can make it do anything I want. <laughs> so anyway, you're probably right in 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 interesting situations, but but uh, I think this is uh, enough. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I very much welcome your comments, Alfred. Please, yes, because I, me and physics are kind of live in different universes. Okay, so anyway, let's go on here. Um, yeah, so um, this is the measure, d pi, and it just it has in the denominator uh, a certain power of the, the first semantic. Um, and with that, uh, we define the Feynman amplitude, um, which, I mean, there are many ways to write it, but, but this is the way they, they, they do it. In the, in the text I was looking at, um, uh, again as an exponential. So in parallel uh, with the with the previous amplitude, the string amplitude, you have an exponential of something. And notice here, and let me point this out once for all. Um, you you're looking at a the, the role of the second semantic. Um, sorry, this is the first semantic. The role of the second semantic is 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 curious um, because that involves uh, the, the the p that mm -hmm. that that uh, involves the uh, momentum, and so it, it can sneak in the momenta dependence on momenta can kind of sneak in uh, in non obvious ways to expressions where you maybe don't immediately see it. So uh, the Feynman uh, well here I, I've explicitly put it in, but uh, the Feynman uh, uh, amplitude does depend on, on the momentum. Okay, so let's go to the next. Yeah, uh, both string and Feynman amplitudes usually diverge. But I mean, this is, this is something that a mathematician will never get used to, but a physicist, uh, uh, no problem. I mean, everything, everything diverges in physics, but somehow uh, they were able to make sense of it, uh, even in divergent situations. Um, so uh, we'd like to relate the, the IG to the asymptotic behavior of the, uh, the, the, the string amplitude uh, as the string lengths, the alpha prime uh, is the string length squared, I think. <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's the string length squared. Uh, and as that goes to zero, we, we get a certain asymptotic behavior and that's what we want to understand. Okay. Right. Um, so, now I'm going to do something that's completely weird, and, and only a physicist would dare to do this kind of stuff. Uh, but it, it, seems to, it seems to give meaningful uh, answers, so let's do it. Um, a stable curve, by definition, in algebraic geometry is a curve C0, uh, which has a finite, first of all, a finite group of automorphisms. And secondly, it's only very mildly, if at all, singular. At worst, the singularities are only ordinary double points. So uh, like uh, simple crossings where a curve crosses itself. Um, and now, given a stable curve, uh, it's not at all clear why this is the right thing to do, but it, it, it is. Um, we define the dual graph of a stable curve to be the graph with vertices corresponding to the irreducible. So a stable curve, remember, it can have ordinary double points. And so it, it can have actually, uh, it may not be irreducible. It may have 
different uh, components that cross each other. And so the, the, the vertices um, are of the graph are the irreducible components of C naught. So C naught may have more than one irreducible component. And the edges, by definition, are just correspond to the points where the irreducible components of C naught uh, meet. So the simplest possible case would be if I have C naught had two components that met at a point, then uh, the graph, the dual graph, uh, would be uh, the vertices. There would be two vertices because there were two ir irreducible components, and there would be one edge because there was only one point where the two met, and the edge, of course, would go between the two components. So you would you would have the two vertices and an edge. It would uh, be a, sort of the evident picture. Okay. So now, yeah, okay. Um, right, so um, we take, a, we start playing with this idea. We take a stable curve with marked points and we take the dual graph uh, with external uh, momenta. Um, and we consider uh, a, a geometric object, a segment, that means a, a path uh, or a map, I guess I should say a map from the, the, path, the, the interval zero one uh, into the closure of the moduli space of uh, uh, marked uh, genus G curves. Uh, such that gamma at zero is the point is the point of the moduli space corresponding to uh, the curve C naught with with uh, n uh, external uh, momenta or n marked points, I should say. Um, and let's see what I want to say here for any admissible segment um, I'm just trying to say if this is obvious or if this is this is a theorem I'm sorry I I, I, well, I wrote it at the top of the thing here um, th this is this is a theorem okay I, I should have made more uh, note of that. Um, mm -hmm. If I look at the limit as alpha prime goes to zero of um, F of gamma of alpha prime, then what I get, so remember F was that funny uh, regulated, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Function on, the, on C cross C. Um, and the limit as alpha prime goes to zero of F of gamma of alpha prime times alpha prime is exactly the ratio of the second semantic and the, the first semantic, where Y is the collection of edge lengths. That's, that's the, a theorem. Mm -hmm. And that that theorem appears in the paper that I that I reference uh, myself with Burgos Gill and Frazan and uh, uh, oh dear and Amini yeah um, right so this is typical I, I, in the remainder of my my talk I want to mention a couple of other such situations where we see this kind of a, a picture. Okay, so uh, let's see, where am I at here? Uh, it doesn't include the page number at the top. So I have to know. I don't want to sort of arrive at the end of the talk. Unexpected. But, um... Uh, they, they, you say it's a theorem, right? <laughs> In the top of your slide. 
Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess I can move on to the next. How how do you change? Oh, there. Okay. So okay. Um, and and this is where um, at this point the, the thing. This is really the reason that I I wanted to explain this um, because here I think maybe we start to see a, a, a nice way to link uh, motive, motives uh, with physics in a more natural way, I, in my opinion, via the Archimedean height pairing. So let me explain the Archimedean height pairing, and then we'll get a couple of uh, further results uh, using the Archimedean height pairing, and then I'll be, I'll be done. Um, so we'll take C uh, to be a smooth projective curve, and we take, ah, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, this, this was intended to be a, a script or a uh, cursive uh, A, but it became R, so let it be R. Uh, so it's rhythm and blues. Okay, so we have two degree zeros divi zero divisors. Uh, on the curve with disjoint support, so they, they don't meet. And then uh, we, we give ourselves a, a log, uh, so this is an algebraic concept, a log one form uh, with, with uh, residue, uh, residue pi. Well, it has residues on R. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, the residue is the cycle R, I mean, the, the, the multiplicities of the, well, okay, that, that has a meaning. The residue of this form is, is R. Okay, and on the other hand, uh, we take another one form, uh, sorry, uh, one chain. This is a, a geometric object, a path, uh, supported on C minus this A, um, and the boundary uh, is the cycle B. So this is a chain uh, with, with endpoints. And if you look at the, the endpoints with the appropriate uh, multiplicity for the chain and the endpoints, uh, you get the, the, the cycle uh, B. And remember B and R are assumed to be disjoint. So uh, by definition, the, the, the height is a, the angular brackets R B is the real point, is the real value of the integral over the, the path gamma B of this logarithmic one form uh, W R, okay? Um, so, so that's the height and that is, I, I'm fascinated with the idea uh, that this uh, notion, which appears in a very central way in arithmetic algebraic geometry, uh, also appears in a, in, a, in a central way in physics. And I, I think that's, that's a nice fact. And so uh, if you take away nothing else, uh, take that away from this, this lecture. Uh, and also uh, you'll see when we look at the theorem that uh, it, we want to take not just uh, uh, a single height, but we want to take a family of heights. So we want to imagine a, a, a continuous uh, moving family of R and Bs, which would be R sub S and B sub S. Okay. So now we go on to the next. So, um, Let's see. What do I want to say here? Yeah, so I have a S is a 3G minus three dimensional poly disk. And I want to consider not just one curve, but a, a, a versal, that means big, don't worry about technical details, uh, analytic uh, deformation 
uh, family of curves over this disk, Pauli disk. Okay. And so we think of that family as being a smooth neighborhood of the original curve in the, the moduli stack. Right? So an open, so C naught is a point in the moduli stack and C is an is a open neighborhood of that point. Okay, so um, uh, let's see, D, E, Right, so this is describing now, I don't wanna, this is not, it's important, but I don't wanna stress it in this, uh, at this moment. Um, on S, so S is sort of the base of this family, but the family can degenerate uh, over certain uh, loci in S. Um, so D is roughly speaking the lo locus uh, in S where the, the fibers are not smooth, okay? And you can describe that as a union of D sub E, where D sub E is the divisor, which corresponds to the deformation where a particular uh, point E remains singular on the curve, okay? Um, and D, this, this is a normal crossings divisor. It's simple enough to convince yourself. And I called U the complement of D. So U then are the points on S over which the fiber, the curve is uh, smooth. Okay. So now we give ourselves a pair. Uh, this, is, this is, remember R is A. So A and, and B of relative RD valued divisors. So these are divisors with labels in RD. Divisors are uh, finite sets of points on the curve, okay? So the key assumption, yeah, and this is, this is very important and I'm taking here material from the, the, the paper that I referenced. Um, and it, it was very, very, this was the, the difficult part uh, of the paper. Fortunately, I, I, I didn't have much, <laughs> I didn't have much involvement at this point in, in, the, in the project. So the difficulties were, were mastered by, by my co-authors, but, but in any case, it was clear that this was the difficult uh, part. Um, there are two situations you can imagine that if the, these, these, these sigma one and sigma two, if they are disjoint, uh, then uh, life is, is easier. So let's assume they are for a moment that they are disjoint on each fiber of pi. And so this is gonna be, uh, with this hypothesis, uh, the height story is gonna be uh, very pleasant and uh, informative. If we drop this hypothesis, uh, then things get a little more difficult. Okay. Um, so we assume that that is that the, the two sections are disjoint on each fiber of pi. Okay. Then the theorem. This is the height theorem. I, I seem to have written the the fact that it's a theorem way up at the top of the slide, which is confusing. Um, but anyway, this is the thing that really caught my eye. Uh, and, and really uh, is, I think, relevant. Um, we, namely, we're not gonna consider one height, we're gonna consider a family of heights. Um, and the idea is, uh, let's see, where did I, um, I should have written the, the a notion, notation for the, for the path. Um, I, I have a path parameterized by S here. And as long as the sections stay disjoint, uh, then as a function of S, um, this, this is continuous. That is to say, 
this expression is 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 given by the ratio of the two semantic polynomials. Remember, psi is the first semantic, and uh, uh, phi is the second semantic. Which, as I yeah, this is a little confusing here. Let, let's just pause for a minute. Uh, in the first instance, it depends on momenta uh, a priori, but I've written two momentas here, and mm -hmm. th that looks a little odd because there aren't two momentas; there's only one. But but uh, in fact, um, what happens is that when it depends on one momentum, it is quadratic in that momentum. So. Um, well, that's because it's Lorentz invariant, right? <laughs> I, I guess, yes, yeah. yes, that would be one way to, to, to think about it. But when I have two momenta, uh, then um, it becomes linear or no, that's, that's wrong. It, it's quadratic, but it's quadratic as a function of two of P1 and P2. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has some terms which are linear in p1 and p2 and it has some terms which are quadratic in p1 or quadratic in p2 mm -hmm. but the linear terms enable me to define a bilinear expression uh which is linear in p1 and p2 and so that that is uh, uh of, of importance although i i don't necessarily want to use it right now but associated to this, in, in, in many cases, there is a bilinear expression, uh, which I denote by angular brackets, Rs, Vs, and that's the height. With an error term, uh, which is bounded. So there exists a bounded function H, such that the, the height of the divisors Rs and Vs, the pairing, uh, is given by this expression with a bounded error. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, just a second, I see where I am. Yeah, this is the last page. So one last uh, theorem. Um, C naught is a stable curve of genus at least one with n marked points. And P1 up to Pn are external momenta which satisfy the conservation law, some Pi equals zero. And the onshell condition, yeah, this is, uh, this is the first time this appears, it, it's important. Uh, that the, remember we had a, a bilinear form on the external momenta and the, the, the pairing uh, of each uh, external momentum with itself it should be zero. Um, then we have another one of these theorems uh, of the sort that we saw before, but in a slightly different uh, context uh for for f and the the theorem says that the limit of alpha prime remember f is this uh function on the product of the curve with itself uh which uh, looks like a a uh, what's it called uh, like a logarithm of x minus y kind of thing um and you take the limit of this and again, you get a, a formula which is just precisely analogous uh, to the theorem we saw before, namely uh, this limit is the ratio of the second semantic uh, and with the first semantic. Um, remember the second semantic involves momenta so that a priori this ratio uh, may involve momenta. Okay. So uh, 
that's the end of my story. Uh, it's just sort of a, 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 a way to, to think about, uh, well, for me, it, it, it brought closer the notion of the arithmetic notion, of, uh, which I'm more accustomed to, uh, in particular, the arithmetic notion of heights, uh, of points on curves, for example, with this physical notion of heights uh, uh, that we, we saw. Maybe I can go back to see. If, can I go back? Is it good? Sorry, I don't know. Uh, sorry, which slide you want to go back, Spencer? Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I want to go back to uh, go go back one at a time. Uh, yes, this is the one. Uh, right. So so. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is, this slide is the, is the, is the takeaway. It's saying that um, this notion of height, uh, and this is the height exactly in, in the algebra geometric sense, arises in a natural way in this physical con context, uh, and that's that's the the, the thing I want to emphasize. Okay, so I stop. Okay, great. Let's thanks to Spencer for this really nice talk. And maybe questions or comments. I see some questions on the chat. Uh, I think it's in a slide seven or a slide eight. There are two questions for the. Um... Let's see. Yeah, this one. Yes. So somebody asked. Uh, how come gamma depends on alpha? Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, which one, which one is it here? Is it how come? Uh, is it this the question? Is in gamma I just mean, a path? Ah, oh, I see. It, it, you had it, a gamma of alpha somehow. A path. Where 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 is gamma? I'm sorry. I need to. I mean, I think uh, I later think on. Is it the gamma is the one chain. Oh, gamma, yeah, no. So there are two, uh, there are two things. There's a one chain, which is gamma. So gamma right. is a, path. yes, it's a path, uh, and the boundary of this path, that is the the endpoints, um, is the, the the zero cycle uh, script B. That's by definition. That's what gamma is. Omega is a differential form, and of course, you set it up that way so that you, you know you can integrate uh, one forms over one chains. And the fact that this is a log one form means you don't want to integrate it. Um, uh, you you want to uh, take its its boundary. You want to take its uh, well. Actually, you do want. To, I'm sorry. You you do want to integrate it. Um, and the angular brackets is defined in, in this in this way. This is the the classical height. I, I don't know. Did I answer your question, or, or is it does it make sense? No. Silence means consent. Okay. <laughs> maybe you go. Maybe can you go to the first theorem um, and the, the one that you. Uh, okay, this to... was this one. Is this, so, is this it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. This was the first theorem. Okay, so then I think here gamma seems to depend on alpha, right? And uh, uh, maybe this notion is unfortunately. I don't gamma. know. I mean, oh, yeah. gamma, uh, there's yeah. f of gamma of alpha. Uh, yes. Oh, that's a good point. Um, you, you are what you're doing. So F. So what? What is F here? Let's see. Um, yeah, presumably F was defined in a previous slide. Um, um, yeah, F was in the string amplitude, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so F is a F, right? I'm sorry. F is F is this function. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and then the then that. Yeah, let me go back. Uh, this one. Yeah. So, uh, 
is there a the uh, this is maybe not obvious. This is maybe a theorem in its own. Is, this is a theorem in its own right. Uh, that when I take the limit, so remember f is this function, and I'm taking the limit of alpha times f evaluated at gamma of alpha. And the theorem says, this, is, this should have a label theorem, it does, but somehow, unfortunately, when I prepared the slides, theorem appears at the top and not where it should. Um, so it's a theorem that this limit as alpha prime approaches zero. So, so gamma is a path and you're looking at the, you're moving this, the, you're looking at the, the starting point of the path, um, then this is this ratio of, uh, of uh, what do I want to say, this, uh, the ratio of semantic uh, polynomials. And uh, so they, it, it, it depends on, on y and also the, yeah, so it's the ratio of the second semantic uh, to the first semantic. No, I I may quickly comment. I think that here we consider the limit of some positive real number, and gamma is a map from numbers from zero to one to the moduli space. And mm -hmm. f input is a point in the moduli space. So the formula of this limit on the left hand side uh, defined more. I mean, not more or less, but it's 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 a well defined thing because well, first I mean, you, that's a, yeah. that's itself a theorem. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yes, and it's a well-defined thing, and in fact, it's it's this well-defined thing. Uh, then the, that's the the content. So um, I, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing. I, I could have better uh, linked these things together if I'd uh, been a more uh, cogent uh, expositor. But but in any case, uh, I, I think it's clear, and, and the philosophy anyway uh, that I do want to emphasize again is is how really close this is to the world uh, of algebraic geometry and even arithmetic algebraic geometry, not considering the non-Archimedean uh, uh, parts, the, the finite primes, but considering the Archimedean part where very typically it's a height of uh, certain algebraic cycles uh, that appears. Uh, and here it's the same, it's again, the same idea or similar. Okay, so I'm done, yeah. Okay. Um... Albrecht, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, um, I mean, of course, at the end, uh, we we don't want the semantic polynomial and the set first or the second, but we want to have the integral, right? Uh, ah. And ah. say a few more words. So, so in a, in a sense, um, I, I think in a sense the important quantity is uh, is um, the amplitude as uh, as it depends on on the momenta on the external momenta. Uh, which amplitude? The Feynman amplitude or the string amplitude? Right. I mean, I guess uh, what you call E E G or, uh, or something. The Feynman. Let's say first the Feynman integral. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. But, but your uh, your observation so far was on uh, the semantic polynomials, right? It was not yes. on the, on the integrand rather than on the integral. That's uh, that's right, and this this surprised me too. That's that's right. So what Albert is saying is just exactly that. That one would have expected uh, the answer to involve actually the integral, but somehow you you cut through that, and what you are what the answer is. Is that this uh, this height pairing um, is is actually yields the integrand, right? Uh, but, and I don't. But it, this this uh, this is a, a common. I mean, it appears several times in this story. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know how to get back to that slide, but one of the slides had alpha prime times uh, F of gamma of alpha prime equal again, the second semantic divided by the first semantic, where F again is this curious function on, on C cross C, which is, uh, uh, so in other words, it's difficult to get the situation uh, back in hand without messing with the slide with the machine. But but uh, let me say that this this same phenomenon where you get the integrand rather than the integral uh, mm -hmm. appears uh, uh, once before in, in this story. Um, uh, right, but I, I think from the physical point of view, maybe it's um, it's it's interesting, but the integral would be better in a sense, right? Because <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, I you know, but reality is what it is. And I went ah. over this a lot of times. I, I think it's correct. No, right. uh, no, no I'm, I, yeah, I'm but I, I fully agree with your your instinct. <laughs> um, yeah. In fact, I was I, I kept looking and checking and looking and checking, and it, it it I I claim that it is as what I what I wrote. But uh, right. Mm -hmm. No, that's. I mean, I, I, I think this is this is uh, yes. But but I think the 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 first theorem in a sense is the string correspondence um, um, uh, so to say statement that if you take alpha prime to zero, zero then, exactly, then yeah. you uh, increase the string tension and then you make the string arbitrarily small, mm -hmm. and, and then and in, in the limit you get and then you get something a field theory right i mean that's uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. so that's sort of expected right yeah uh, but it's nice to see this so concretely i mean in, and yeah. and it was also was it true that you can get different Feynman graphs depending on how you take the gamma and the limit yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely. you get a lot of Feynman graph basically yeah. You could, uh, I mean, a priori, I don't have examples, but a priori, yeah, it does yeah. depend on the choice uh, of yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. Which is also kind of uh, kind of natural because one a string amplitude, let's say, um, uh, encodes several uh, field theory um, Feynman graph um, topologies. Ah, okay. Good point. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, huh. so I think that that but but i mean the my, maybe my question is um i mean of course in 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 physics we are often very pragmatic we want to have the function <laughs> uh, are you saying that in algebraic geometry we're not pragmatic no no i mean pragmatic in the sense that that uh, okay you're telling uh, you're telling me there is a, a beautiful correspondence between the string amplitude and the feynman integral yeah, right? yeah. Uh, yeah. but um but what uh, what if I like to have the function that the um, that the Feynman integral is, um, uh, what does it? I mean, is it easier? I mean, some people said it's maybe better to first calculate the uh, uh, string amplitude and take the alpha prime limit to zero, uh, because if you would be able to calculate the uh, string amplitude, then you would get many Feynman graphs, the sum of many Feynman graphs already, because of these different limits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that actually when I when I wrote this down for the first time, I had a sort of deja vu experience, only I, 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 I had thought that I had it wrong. That is to say that what I had written down was wrong. But I've been over and over and over and over, and I really think that this is what, and I've even right. seen it in, in the literature. I really think that the, 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 the statement of the theorem is, is what, I, I, I don't want to say it's correct, but I, I think it's what one does, uh, what the theorem does say. But you're, right. you're right. I mean, it's, it's odd that, that you, you, you get the integrand and not the integral. And, and I... But I mean, uh, is, maybe it's not so strange because uh, after all, your your string integral. I mean, this f was not the integral. It was not the string integral. It it also had to be integrated, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. So I think it's all correct. Uh, I hope so. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, I think it's all correct. 
maybe I can maybe I can pester you privately uh, with some questions in the future. Right. Okay. All right. Anyway, I mean, the, um, I think um, I, I, I enjoyed it, of course. I don't know uh, now what to say because this is now, a, 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 I mean, we have various talks and I think the ne next one uh, I should give will be some physical applications of, 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 uh, of this um, expression that Spencer wrote down. I mean, the, 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 the semantic polynomials and the integral integral and then I will try to do as also you and Van Hove and Kerr did to do the integral. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's basically but, but, my, uh, my, my subject then. And, and uh, just for people's convenience, so what do you remember the day and the date? And the, I think it's the Friday, right? Uh, the Friday, this Friday in a week. Yeah, right? Friday 20, 25th, the next one. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have uh, the, the, the advertisements here, let's see. I have Matt's, I have mine, uh, I've lost yours. Albrecht, I've lost you. Uh, let's see if, if you appear peripherally. Yeah, I have a picture of you, but it doesn't give a... Uh, Maybe it's just a title, yeah. Uh, it doesn't even give a title. It says 20... Well, then it's uh, just a lecture series. So, okay, I, uh, good, good that you remind me. I have to give the title then. Uh, Possibly if you scroll oh. down, you'll see the information you want. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I, I'm just being stupid here. Uh, uh, application of kalabi yao periods and scattering amplitudes. Right, right. That was the idea. That's... Um, that's I mean that's basically the the uh, I mean the hope or the I mean what partially works is that uh, that you um, that you um, calculate these uh, these integrals by techniques that come from variation of hot structures and and so that you can get very concrete functions that uh, that give you the integral. I mean this has more to do with differential equations and so on, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So you mean you actually want a number? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want a function, uh, a function uh, of the external momenta or the physical parameters. Uh, Albrecht, should yes. we expect to clarify the relations with uh, gerfan kapran of zilevinsky type of hypergeometric systems? Hyper yes, yes. I think uh, that... And that, the, that uh, the role of Landau type discriminant, the singularities of discriminant type. And so. Yeah, that is all in this package, yeah. Uh, okay. That, you, that in many cases, the uh, the differential equation for simple Feynman graph is uh, gelfand kapranov selevinsky type resonance system. And, uh, and then you can, um, I mean, as you said, you, the... The, the discriminant of the system will be the Landau singularity of the Feynman graph, and this has all mm -hmm. has translations into the uh, into the properties of the uh, Feynman graph. This part of mm -hmm. mathematics, of course, is very old mathematics. Maybe it's not uh, so exciting, but mm. oh, it's exciting if you want to, if you can give good examples, and it would be nice. But yeah, practical it is. I mean, yeah. I mean, also it has it it does not just apply to quantum field theory, but also to other perturbative problems. For instance, uh, to the, I mean, um, to if you if you do um, scattering, if you want to uh, uh, find the gravitational wave profile of um, of the that people measure at LIGO and LISA. Then, um, then you can also do a perturbation theory in general relativity, where also Calabiao um, uh, periods appear. So that, so it it seems to be quite universal in this perturbative approach to physical problems, um, that that these kinds of functions appear. Uh, yeah, so that's um, that's also nice. <laughs>